Okay, good morning. So today we're going to build on what we've been working on with the metronome project. Um, if you remember so far, if I open this in File Explorer, um, the index.html, we've got the user interface, um, we've got some buttons that um, in theory should hopefully do something, but doesn't yet. Um, we've got a start button that does nothing whatsoever. So we're focused on the HTML, that's the hypertext markup language, the content and the structure. And the CSS, that's the rules for the appearance for each element on the screen. And we've applied rules for IDs and classes and tags. We want to get focused on um, the behavior, the JavaScript. But before we do, if we have a look at the specification and go pretty much all the way to the end, I'm going to search for CSS and it will tell us near the beginning that we need to learn HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and then we panic because all of them have got loads of stuff on there, and then we find the appendix at the end that reassures us because there's very little we actually need to recognize and use in an exam. So a small subset of tags. Um, the only one we haven't really done yet is a form. We'll come back to that later, and we haven't talked about bullet points, but they're dead easy. We've done a little bit about CSS. You can do them inline, and remember we said that's a bad idea because it duplicates all the stuff. You've got to put individual rules on every tag. A much better way of doing it would be one rule for every H1, a heading one, so that all of them can be blue with one line. We can have classes. Remember an element um, can share a class with another element, and that doesn't just have to be the same tag. You can have paragraphs with a class, as well as buttons with a class, as well as heading ones with a class. And you can have IDs, and that's a one-to-one -one relationship. Only one element on the page can have an ID of menu or any other um, thing. So we've got all of these rules that we've talked about. We want to move on to JavaScript. So we can um, find bits, set bits, write bits, and display stuff. And that's all you need to remember. Anything else will be given to you in the question. So we'd probably better go through these first. Let's pop that over there, pop this over here. Um, and we'll go through each one, and then we'll find some bits that are useful. So first of all, we've already said you can access the DOM, the document object model, using the global variable document. What does that mean? Well, if you make some stuff in HTML with some tags, it's useful to be able to manipulate those, and you do that using the, the DOM, document object model. You can get an element by ID, and then you can use it by storing it as a variable or a constant later in the program. So we've done that. One thing we haven't done yet is setting a variable. So what shall we do? Um, let's have um, something in here that we want to change. So maybe after our start button, maybe down at the bottom, we can have a div with an ID of status. Um, and we'll just say press start to run. Won't do anything exciting yet. I'll just say press start to run. And then when you click this button, it's going to say running. Or maybe even when you hover your mouse over it, it could say whatever you want. We just want to be able to change this uh, when different events happen. So how do we do that? Well, in our JavaScript, we need to add an event listener. Um, so let's see, have we got this start button yet? No, we haven't. What did we call it in the HTML? We should have a button with an ID of, oh, I used btn start stop. There we go. So let's get it. Comps, because it doesn't change anywhere in the program. We'll use the DOM, the document object model. We'll get an element. It's case sensitive in JavaScript, so be really careful about your capitalization of ID. Very common mistake. That won't work. This will work. Give it the ID that we've got. Semicolons are optional, but strongly recommended. It won't give you an error message, but it'll just mean that you're not able to minimize your code later. And the web browser will have to do extra work to guess where the semicolons go. Let's change the way that this is split so you can see all the lines of code. So once we've got this, we can add an event handler. Now, we did it slightly differently last time. Are we supposed to add an event handler? No, we don't even know. You don't even have to remember this bit but it's still really useful. You'll see it in lots of examples. BTN start stop. That's the object that we've got from our page. We're going to add an event listener. 
very similar to what we've done here, but a different way of doing it. If we're going to add an event listener, we need to know two things. First of all, which event are we listening for? And the one I want to respond to is when you click on the button. Then we need to know what's going to happen. And there's different ways of doing this. I'm going to stick with one that's probably easier for you to um, understand. So we have a function here. And I'm just going to go back and do this one more time. This is a parameter for the add event listener um, method. Um, I'm not going to give it a name. I'm just going to say it is a function. It has one parameter. Open, close, curly braces, and I'm going to put them on new lines. So for now, I'm just going to say console.log click so that we can detect and see if it works. If it works, you can't see it unless you've got the developer console that's F12, and it is happening. If you spell it wrong or you get it wrong, you'll see an error, and it will tell you where it is. That error won't be visible unless you've got the developer console because normal punters, normal clients aren't interested in coding errors. If you're interested, the syntax that seems to be recommended is not supported in Internet Explorer, but it is recommended now um, in the latest version of, um, of JavaScript, which is supported by almost every modern browser, um, is for anonymous functions, we just put some brackets in if there's going to be any parameters. And then we use this fat arrow notation. So it's just a shorthand version of saying, all right, I've got an anonymous function here. And if there's only one parameter, we don't even need those brackets. So this is an anonymous function that's going to be called when we click. I would strongly recommend that you don't learn this syntax for the exam, um, because not every marker might be aware of it. I would always use the function one, which I'm going to put in again. There we go. Um, what do we want to happen? Well, so far we had console.log. I'm going to add in a horrible way of doing it, but the specification says we need to know it. This is directly writing to the document. Document.write. I don't even know if this is going to work. Um, click. Let's see. We press start, and it overwrites the whole page. It's horrible. If you try and do this after the page is loaded... It will overwrite the whole thing. So it works, but don't do it. I mean, you could, if you wanted, write a whole HTML page in here. But the user um, usability would be terrible because you've just overwritten the whole page. So don't do that. But I've taught you what it does, so you can recognize it and remember. If you want, you can use another thing which is terrible for usability, which is this alert. An alert is what it sounds like. It makes you panic. You've just clicked. And it's called a modal dialog box, because you can't do anything on that page until you've serviced this dialog box. And it's a way to really frustrate your users, because they can't carry on browsing or scrolling or clicking or anything until they... Press OK. In the olden days, there was no way around it. Now, if you keep doing it, Chrome will eventually ask you, do you want to avoid um, dialog boxes? Which is basically shorthand for saying this developer doesn't really know what they're doing, or this is a very early development model. So this works. It's easy. It's good for debugging. Better for debugging is the console.log, because it's unoffensive. You can put whatever you want in here, and you'll only ever see it if you've got the developer toolbar. You don't need console.log. You can have console.error if you want, which doesn't crash. It just gives you something in red, which you can filter out if you want. Or you can have a console.warning. But by far and away, the one that you see most is console. Oh, no, console.warning isn't. I don't know what it is. Sorry. Just use console.log if you want debugging things. And it tells you which part of the code um, displayed it. And you can even click on it, and Google Chrome has some fantastic debugging tools to help you. Right, we don't want that. I want it instead to overwrite this bit. So how do we do that? Well, first, we've got to gain access to that object. So we can do 
document dot get element by id what is it we need to identify it i think that's id that div had an id of status lovely so i can pop that in there in the past i've saved that as a constant so i can use it later but you can use what's called chaining if this is a method that returns a document object that we can use then we can just do full stop to access it and then we can do the last thing that we need to be aware of in here which is anything on your page dot inner html dot inner html equals um started there we go so this time rather than overwriting the whole page it just overwrites one particular part of the page which is much much better a little bit of an investigation while i pause the video you've got inner html and inner text which both seem to do the same thing what's the difference you investigate find out we've had a really good question what on earth is this e the e is an argument um, which is passed as a parameter to the click event handler, which sounds horribly technical. To show you, I'm going to do console.log e, and then when I refresh the page and click on the console, that event gets passed down here. And notice you, you, you can send messages, but you can also send more complex data types and see them all down here. So this is details about the event that's just happened. So you can find out where the mouse pointer was when they clicked you can find out um, whether the shift button was pressed you can find out everything you'd need to know and more about that click event the question was what's the difference between inner html and inner text and the answer has been given correctly that inner text doesn't support html for example if i put h1 in here and don't click me and run it then you'll see literally those um, angular brackets if you do in a HTML and do the same thing then it will interpret it as HTML and sometimes you want one and sometimes you want the other so it's just being aware of the difference between the two we don't want it to say don't click on me um, we want to give some kind of indication of whether it's running or not running so a bit more important than that, let's change the button. So instead of saying start, let's make it say stop. So I don't really want that status thing anymore. That was just to show you it's possible. After all that effort that you did doing that, gutted, sorry. This time, I want to change the text inside the button. Already got a constant that allows me to access it. But we've got to be careful here. It's not going to be inner HTML because the start is not inside the tag. It's not like you have this, where the text is here. Instead, it's an attribute. So it's a lot easier for us, actually. We can just say the value is stop. Let's see if that works. I press start, and it's changed it to stop. Lovely. So what I want is something that I can toggle. So I can keep track of whether or not it's running, and whenever I press start or stop, it gives us the opposite. So we need a Boolean. I'm going to call it running, and we'll set it to false at the beginning. In our event handler, we can say, just like in C-sharp, running is equal to the opposite of what it currently is. And then, rather than always setting it to stop, we can say, and we've got the same shorthand syntax here, we can say, is it running? Question mark, yes or no. Right, you tell me what goes in here. So yeah, well done. This is a Boolean expression using this Boolean variable. And we're saying if this is true, as in running is currently true, it is running, then the button changes to stop. If running is currently false, that means the metronome is not running. We want the option to be able to start it. So well done, good logic. It doesn't actually do anything yet but it looks more promising. And we're getting there. So far, all we've got is something that will let us set something and buttons that don't do anything. But hopefully you know enough now to um, display the BPM whenever you press start. 
um, we know what it is. Let's remind ourselves how far we got before. We have got a variable for the beats per minute, and we are actually changing it when we press the decrease button, but it's not updating this thing here. So what I'm going to do is make a function. This time I don't want it to be anonymous. I want it to have a name. So can I call it update BPM? And I want to change the value here to whatever the variable is. So I think, yeah, I've got a constant called BPM input. Lovely. BPM input dot value is equal to BPM. We've got an error. No, not yet. When I press the button, it looks like nothing's happening. In fact, it is decreasing the value of the variable, but we don't see it. Let's see if it works. Console.log BPM, first of all. Yeah, that doesn't look like it's happening either. Oh, it's because I'm pressing the wrong blooming button. Sorry. Let's press that one. There we go. It is going down. The variable's changing, but the variable is not being updated in this box because we haven't told it to. So, let's call our function exactly the same kind of syntax as we're used to. We have a function, we give the function a name, the function can have parameters, the function does something. The only difference is there is no um, syntax for a procedure. So we have to break our own rules by having a function that doesn't return a value. Which is a bit irritating. Um, so now we're calling this, hopefully, press this. And this changes. Lovely. That's what I want. I don't think this works yet. Why? Because we haven't got an event handler for when we click on it. So it's not currently increasing the BPM. And it's not currently updating the value of this. That's your next challenge. If we remind ourselves of our Word document, we said a good test table is written in advance in the design section. And a good test table becomes your to-do list. So we've kind of done... Um, Lots of this. This now works. We've just added in the code, copied and pasted the decrease, changed it to increase, made it increase, and it kind of works. I want this. I want it so that if you try and increase it above 120, then it just stays at 120. That doesn't happen at the moment. That's a test fail. So at the moment, what happens is it will just go up and up and up and faster and faster and faster. My test table says we should have some validation that makes it stop at 120. So, in your test table, we have a copy of what we want to happen. Let's go view and split so we can see that up here and come back to it later. We go to our testing section and we add in an extra test. Come on. And this is the bit of your code, sorry, your write-up, that is probably going to take maybe even hundreds of pages. It's going to be quite a lot of work here. Scroll up here because we split it so we can get all of these. Lovely. Paste that in there. Right, test number. Yeah, here we go. So sometimes our tests fail. Let's put an actual result in. Insert columns to the right. Actual result. Come on. Fail. BPM keeps increasing. So if that happens, you don't want to screenshot and prove that it fails every single time. But every now and then in your project, you'll want some examples of things that don't go to plan and then show what you can do to fix it. So let's work on how we can fix that, shall we? I just want some validation in here. And each time we change it, we call this update BPM. So why don't we do some validation inside update BPM? Let's do a range check. We should always comment our code. If BPM is greater than, and we need brackets for um, for this, um, 120. Or if we were doing this properly, we should have max BPM so that we could set it later. Let's make a constant up here somewhere. Const max BPM equals 120. Because you might actually want to go higher than that at some point. What's the point of a constant? It makes your code easier to read. It makes it easier to change later. Then we just set um, the BPM to the max BPM. And we can also do the same down here. If it's less than the minimum BPM, the slowest possible speed, the slowest beats per minute. 
Unlike Python, if you try and change a constant whilst your program runs, you get a runtime error, which is much better. I think we said the minimum was supposed to be 60, and I can't remember. Was it 50? There we go. Um, and that should work, hopefully. Let's see. Let's test it. Let's go up to 120. And now I can keep clicking, but it stops at 120. So we'll put a little screenshot in. We'll explain what we've done. Put some code in. Um, I've added some validation or a range check. Okay, so whenever you prove that you've passed a test, then we need the code. The code must always be readable. I don't care if you submit something with hundreds of pages, um, as long as it's readable. I really, really don't want you to save space by having tiny, unreadable things, because it will get moderated down. You can copy and paste the actual code if you want, but bear in mind if you do that, um, then you don't get line numbers. And Word tries to um, autocorrect it. So um, I think screenshots are preferable, even though they're not editable. But you've got an editable copy in the whole thing. You'll submit the whole code at the very end as an appendix. But I want to see the code relevant to each test on here. So as well as the code, I'd like a little screenshot to prove that it works. Ideally annotated, saying what you've done. So if we have a look at our test table, and I shouldn't have stopped splitting it, sorry. Um, I think the next test was, um, you know, what happens if you manually set it to 119, and then you try and increase it. I'm pretty sure as we've coded it, that'll work. So we've just done test 8. Maybe you can try and do test 9, test 10. Oh no, it's just test 9. Here we go. What am I talking about? Oh dear, look. Terrible. 89789. Nine. That's no good. <laughs> Oops. My test numbers are all messed up. But you get the idea. This is why sometimes it's helpful to have a better numbering convention for your tests. And you go for, like, if it's success criteria 8, you might go for um, 8A, 8B, 8C. Because if you want to add extra ones in later, it becomes much easier rather than renumbering everything. But I'll leave that for you to decide. So let's move on. We want something to happen when you press start, and it should happen again and again and again. So we need to do our actual uh, main algorithm, I guess, to work out um, how to schedule something that will happen at some point in the future. Right, where's the bit that happens when we start it. Here we go. We're pressing the button. We'll probably want something in here that says, if running, then, um, what do we want to happen? Well, we've got set timeout, which will happen once, or set interval, which will happen lots. Let's start with set timeout, because it's a bit easier. And we'll say, what's going to happen? Um, let's say, on tick. And we're going to do it every second to begin with, to keep it really simple. What on earth is on tick? Well, we're going to make a function called on tick. And just a console.log tick. World's worst metronome where you have to sh um, be a developer to show the developer console. Um, and it only works at 60 beats per minute, which is every second. And it only ticks once. Terrible. Instead of set timeout, which happens once, let's do set interval. Oh, if you spell interval correctly which will do the same, but it will keep um, requesting a callback every however many milliseconds until you cancel it. Beware, because if you press it multiple times, we'll end up with lots of callbacks, all requesting to be called every second, to the point where all of them are calling back. So that's a problem. 
Problem we probably won't even have time to fix today. Um, so we want to calculate the correct amount for BPM. So let's work it out. Let's say var milliseconds. And this is the only algorithm we've got. What did we say in our Word document? Well, we said it's the beats per minute. And then you can put in your calculation from your Word document. So there we go. We've got our beats per minute divided by 60,000 for minutes and um, then into, sorry, put into seconds, then milliseconds. And then we've got to use the correct value in here. So in theory, hmm, that doesn't look right. This looks much better. 60,000 divided by BPM. Jolly good. Right, so that should be once every second. And then if we refresh the page and type 120, it should be twice as fast. Better. Now, it doesn't update it when we press the buttons. It still goes at the same speed. So we need to store something that will let us change this later. So let's have our callback and set it to undefined. It's not set to anything at all. But whenever we do this, we can say the callback will store the thing that will let us cancel this. Um, and we'll cancel any previous one. So clear interval. Doesn't matter if you pass in something that's undefined. Just so that we can't have multiple ones, that error that we were displaying um, earlier. So let's see. If I run it multiple times, we should only ever get one thing happening. This algorithm is rather useful, really. Um, so I'm going to cut it and just say update uh, metronome. Or maybe, hmm, I don't know. I don't want to have it every time. I don't want to have it the same as here because we shouldn't make it run if it's stopped and we press a button. Let's, I don't know, give it a name. Function change speed while running. Give it a name that you think is sensible. Or set speed and start. Something like that. So let's see, will it run? Yeah, it does. And then when we do update BPM, we should probably say if running, then we should set speed and run. As in it cancels a previous running one and then it goes. So let's see, we start it at one word, per, sorry, one beat per minute. We increase on the fly up to 120 and it's working, it's good. For now, for testing purposes, let's bump up the maximum BPM to 520. Refresh the page and just see if it works. Let's go up all the way up here. Notice when you click the button, it cancels the callback. So as long as you click the button again fast, you're not going to see a tick. But as soon as you stop clicking, the tick's going to happen. So you probably don't really want that to happen. You could change it to make it a bit different. But it does look to me like this is working. Which is exciting. We're pretty much there now. All you want to do now is give some visual indication on the screen. Maybe some lights going on and off. Um, and then making something tick. But we're going to stop and polish that off at the end of next lesson. So can you please add something onto your tests to prove that it is actually starting and stopping? We haven't yet done tests. My tests 15, 16 and 17. That's what we'll do next time.